there are a lot of companies that produce just a ton of content and they miss what was arguably the most important side of it, which is distribution. What are you doing with all this content you're sitting on? Are you a dragon hoarding shit? Maybe not. Welcome to another great episode of Marketers Talking Marketing. Today we're joined by Justin. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so uh, I am a, I guess, half uh, creator. I have a podcast, I have a newsletter, I have some other things in the works, uh, slash consultants. I work with uh, several B2B SaaS companies advising on content marketing, distribution, repurposing, all those type of things. And so... Yeah, I've got uh, got a nice mix going on here. Happy, yeah. to, happy to chat, Jess. Yeah, and I think one of the reasons that I initially gravitated towards your content, aside from knowing each other from working together, <laughs> is there are a lot of companies that produce just a ton of content and they miss what was arguably the most important side of it, which is distribution. What are you doing with all this content you're sitting on? Are you a dragon hoarding shit? Maybe not. How did you... Because I think you've also kind of niched on the distribution side. I mean, your podcast namesake. Tell us tell us more about distribution and and why you focus on it so heavily. Yeah, yeah. So, so my show and really the frameworks I implement, everything I'm building around is this idea of distribution first and essentially flipping content marketing on its head. So anybody who's been in content marketing for a long time. You know, I've been in, into it for 12 years at this point. And when I started, it was all about publishing content. It was all about you know hitting publish on your blog and then moving on to the next thing and hitting publish on your blog and moving on to the next thing. As social media has sort of come up and, and grown, you know, that when I started, Twitter was really probably in its infancy. Uh, Facebook was maybe a little bit more mature, but not really as like a content marketing sort of engine. And now everybody's sort of really shifting toward uh, a different way and a different approach of doing content. But the philosophies haven't really evolved with that. There's still a lot of content programs, uh, a lot, a lot of content programs that focus on publishing content and hitting publish. And they do not care about... I mean, I don't want to say they don't care, but they're not focused on what happens after you hit publish. And so really that, that's that been a focus for me in, in terms of working with clients and, and honestly, even working at previous companies was, hey, we're spending all this time creating all this content and then we just move on to the next thing. And it's like, oh gosh, like, can't we just do some more with it? <laughs> I feel like AI is is kind of, not to go into AI <laughs> initially, but uh, I was working on a tool for a client, a workflow for helping produce a larger volume of content with the goal of good content that's SEO'd and came across a handful of tools that are really leveraging AI just to produce the volume. But like, what do you do with all of that content? It feels like we're going, AI is driving us maybe in that direction of more and more volume without the distribution side being solved. And if you haven't solved it, you know, what are you doing with it? You're not really getting the most out of it. Yeah, it I, like. I I think, mo and I'm actually in the process of this with a couple different companies right now, but I, I would guess if you took a step back and started auditing your content and actually looking at what was happening with the things you were publishing, you would start to see a massive gap in between what you think might be working or what you actually, what you hope will happen uh, versus what's actually happening. And so at any given company, depending on the structure, I mean, the AI thing, I, I've seen va lots of people talking about how to like, how do you know how we can use this to like, just pump out more content and get more stuff out. And it's like, well, that's not really the goal. Like the goal for content marketing isn't just to produce content. Like it's not a volume game anymore. The, it's honestly for me. I even I even am seeing, and I came up in SEO, but I'm just seeing less emphasis on the need to start there, and more emphasis on creating a story, building an audience, building a community of people who are interested in the same things you are. Versus like, let's rank for you know the top ten terms around our product offering, and you know just kind of end up in a commodity list amongst every other company out there. It's funny because this is a general generalization, but I think if you audit, if you took a step back, started auditing that content, you would probably start to see that 
20% or less of the content that's currently sitting on your website is driving 80% of the traffic to your website. And so it's just a matter of looking at that and trying to get a number and to understand like, oh man, we've got a lot of stuff that's just literally not doing anything. Where so when you're thinking about auditing content, are you starting with Google Analytics? Where you where you where do you take a first stab at that? Yeah, I'm probably starting with within GA and looking at kind of the lay, the lay of the land, and then maybe expanding out to like Search Console, and then expanding out to like maybe a SEMrush or a Hrefs or something like that, and just trying to build a more holistic view of what the content is doing and understand what a company's distribution strategy is you know for some companies that's well we're on twitter and we're on linkedin and we're do we do email sometimes and we do this rather than like okay like well what's your plan for this next piece of content that's coming out and it's like uh hit publish on it and go so yeah do you find most companies don't even have a distribution plan correct yeah yeah i think i think uh I read a stat, it was an older stat, but I, I'm guessing it hasn't changed too much that only 39% of companies have a written content marketing plan. So then wow. now, now you're talking about companies who have a, a written content distribution plan. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's probably 1%. It's probably less than 1% of, of companies that actually have like, hey, when we publish a podcast, this is the motion that gets put in place. When we publish a blog post, this is the motion that puts in place. And the whole idea of distribution first is to understand even where you're going. So to say, we do we do LinkedIn and we do email. Well, okay, how many emails are you sending every week? Uh, we send one. Okay, so you need one email sent a week. Okay, how, how many times are you posting on LinkedIn? Three, five. Okay, so you need you know, five pieces of content for that given week. How much content do you have to create to be able to yeah. fill that distribution and, and yeah. really understand what that is? Because most pe- most companies are creating infinitely more things than they could ever distribute and get out to their audience. Yeah, that's it's interesting because I'm just thinking through even as a marketer, plans that I have built as a marketer. And I like to think my content plans include distribution, but I definitely... I definitely typically approach it from the we're going to make this content, you know, for to res, you know, we're going to make a new gated asset because we need more leads. <laughs> and then how do we get it out there? And then also we have this like evergreen kind of content plan for for social or for our partners and how does it fit in and kind of melding it together. Is it often is it difficult for clients to start thinking about it distribution first or does it kind of come naturally once you get into it? I think it's easy to see why it would be effective. It's harder to implement because there's a lot of upstream processes that have to change, right? Like we're people in place. So, hey, we've got two content writers. What do we have them do? Mm-hmm. Or we don't have an, you know, a social media marketer. Like what do we do? Like our, our writers write blogs. They don't write social content. So like there's a disconnect there in terms of like, or our writers write blogs. They don't write email content. So there's a disconnect, a disconnect between the creation and the distribution side and how those things meld together. And that's a gap I see in a lot of organizations and a lot of folks that I talk to is like, we just aren't connecting the dots. Like we are not properly communicating, understanding, having this 30,000 foot view of like when we create something, the goal cannot be to push publish and hope Google picks it up and then eventually hope it will rank for keywords and hope that it'll eventually get out there that might be fine. I actually think SEO is great for long term because that stuff can last. But what's going to happen in the two to four months of of that piece starting to try to rank? Is it just going to sit there and do nothing? I've been seeing, you know, speaking of SEO, I've been seeing more and more programmatic SEO approaches where companies are putting out like two, three hundred pages at a time of, you know, very similar content with very specific changes to it. And it feels like that's another example of like, would that even work? Or is that just flooding your site with hope, you know, almost like the 80 20 rule? Like, if I put enough content out, something will hit. <laughs> something yeah. will work. Yeah. I think, I think philosophically that I think can make sense. But I think you also have to understand like, what is the experience you're giving to a, to a user? Like, what's, and then what's the experience that you have as that content marketer, that marketer managing all that? You're now managing 300 pieces yeah. of content that you have to keep up to date and understand and manage and, and really get all of that honed in to say, this is our 
you know, this is our X content. This is our Y content. This is, like, it's a lot to undertake and to manage for if you want to do it well versus like just, well, we're, we've got, you know, we've got 300 things and, you know, they're all, they're all going to rank eventually, or it's going to, you know, we're going to flood this so that 30 of them, you know, 10% rank. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it depends on what your goal is. If your goal is keywords, ranking sessions, maybe even that could all be fine. But one of the things I've learned over my career is that all of those things are super subjective at the end of the day anyway, because a session isn't a session. If somebody clicks on a particular post and it's at a particular part in the customer life cycle, it doesn't really matter. Um, versus if somebody else clicks a different piece, you know, they might be more willing to try or buy or whatever off of that. But also that, that, it, it's not this instant thing, right? Like when's the last time you read a blog and we're like, yes, I'm buying this thing right now um, or, re or like Googled something. This is a thing I think I don't think people realize either with like SEO distribution is like, and it's fine, but like, I am not, I am never associated with a brand after Googling them. I'm like, cool. Got my answer. Thank you. I'm moving on to my life again. It's not like, Oh, that brand was so helpful. Like, I'm so glad I clicked on that and saw like their name at the top and like they gave me the information. Yeah, you know? I've definitely had a few times where I was looking for like templates and tools and I found them and I was like, oh, this is a good site. I'm going to earmark it for later. And do I go, do I ever go to my bookmarks tab? No, I go and I Google something else and I maybe come back to it. And it's like after enough repetition, I start remembering just to go to that site. But it's maybe three, and one of them is Spark Toro. Yeah, <laughs> which is also just like. <laughs> but Spark Toro's done a fishkin. great job of like building their brand as <laughs> yeah. well. Like they wouldn't. That I've actually heard both Amanda and Rand talk. Like they're, they think of SEO as kind of like, which is hilarious to hear Rand talk like that. But like as like this sort of thing that they're not really interested in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is wild. You it's know, just I mean they put moms. out so much good content. Yeah, I think that's like the the like golden state or like the ideal is if you put out good content, it will attract the right audiences, but you have to make that gap between your good content and where your audience is currently living. Um, but definitely like they, they, they put out such great, this is now just a, a spark taro uh, fan podcast. The last episode they came up too. <laughs> so, ah, there you go. Um, you know, but it's, it's good content too. So it's valuable, right? Mm -hmm. it, that's what really builds like the affinity with it. Yeah. Do you uh do you have a favorite distribution channel? I think my favorite distribution channel uh is becoming email. Funny enough, like we're going back to email days, but I just think yeah. newsletters, email, having something that you can own and communicate with at will is very very valuable and also having folks give up their email is more just it's a higher level of sort of community or audience building than a social follow. Like for yeah. me to give you my email is like, I'll follow you on social, but to give up my inbox takes a little bit more effort. And so I think email is, is probably my favorite distribution channel for that because you can, once you build the audience, you can create whatever you want. You don't have to worry about an algorithm like, oh, LinkedIn doesn't like videos. I can't post videos. Oh, Twitter doesn't like this. I can't do that. Oh, you know, Instagram doesn't like this. I can't. You can literally just post whatever you want. And if your audience finds it valuable, they'll consume it. Yeah, it's really is the only place where people are opting in to interact with you, you know, because even if you follow a page, you know, you're not going to see 100% of the content. No, not at all. Yeah, yeah. Not at I all. love email marketing. I think people... Honestly, I'm also into like some old school stuff like direct mailing. Uh, mm. But I think a lot of people, they kind of shit on email marketing and they'll talk about open rates being low and, you know, this and that. But if, if you do it well and you do it right and you hit your list respectfully and right. not spam the heck out of them, you know, you it, it can be valuable. I bought so much stuff from emails. Yeah. Yeah. You're, so bu you're building that over time and then it's easy yeah. to, it's easy to, and again, it's not like every email every email that I'm or newsletter I'm subscribed to a lot of them, I just delete, but I'm not unsubscribing and I'm still seeing them pop up in my feed. So it's like, Oh yeah, yeah. they exist. Like, Oh yeah. I, you know, and, yeah. it, it, but that is true. And that's something to think about with distribution and as well as like, even in for email, right? Like if you had a 50% open rate, which is solid, yeah, that's still 50% that are not seeing the content that you have. Right. And so yeah. it's like, you got to think about these ways to get, get that content back out there. Yeah. 
I, I'm subscribed to your email list. I don't read every email, but I do read probably like every five or six. Yeah. And then I'll come in and yeah. So I think I, I agree. I agree with that. It's also, I've been looking more at, um, <laughs> I keep saying stack overflow, sub stack. I think it's interesting how sub stack and the rise of being able to more easily monetize newsletters in general, where it makes it more of almost a commercial product instead of this like one-to-one -one intimate conversation in your inbox that I think email marketing used to be more, more positioned as. Yeah. And, and I think like just that individual, like human to human connection of like a newsletter, a lot of the, almost, I would say the vast majority of newsletters that I subscribe to, even if they're from a business come from a person. Yeah. Right. And so like a person at that business. And so it, it humanizes the business to where like, even on social company page, you know, it, it, that's a slog, right? Because in, 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 on any platform, because it's just an icon, it's just a, you know, X company with their icon and it, there's mm -hmm. the personality, the, like, it's really, really hard to break through on that versus an email can be a little bit more personal, a little bit more, Hey, this is who it's coming from at the company. Oh yeah. I like that. I like that gal. Yeah. I like that guy. He, I'm glad he's sending me this email. We ran a test, I want to say four or five years ago, I was running marketing for a company that sold to developers. And so we tested different people internally and we found that a someone who I think to them was more relatable. So using like a a head of or maybe a director or manager person and coming from a woman had the highest open rates hmm. and the highest engagement rates when it was versus like a CEO or VP with it. So we I would say that. Yeah. So we, we, we would lean into that a little bit. <laughs> like, where is Melissa? <laughs> <laughs> Sending it from Melissa today instead of Mike. Oh, I've been seeing more and more success with using plain text formatted emails from companies, but using it from a human, like the you know director of demand gen, but plain text emails over visually formatted ones too. So it yeah, feels like that's, that's a, I mean, that's what we did when, when we started revamping stuff at metadata, it all came from Mark and it was a plain text, it, whether it was a, you know, demand like session, uh, promotion, or it was a demand gen U podcast episode, or it was just a news, like really trying to just play again, play to that. Like, this is the type of thing that shows up in my inbox from my friend versus this is the type of thing that shows up in my inbox from Coles or from, yeah. you know, like from a uh, somebody who's just trying to sell me something. Yeah. You know, it's a different vibe. Yeah. Do you think we're getting a little fatigued of those like beautifully formatted emails? I, I see it on social too, people moving towards more organic raw feeling images versus ones that are like clearly staged and Photoshopped. I think so. I think the sort of rise of YouTube shorts, TikTok, like reels on the video side is helping influence that on in other creative avenues as well to where I'm much more drawn to something that like, I'm sure, I, I'm sure somebody's done a study on this, but if you just look at your own patterns, how fast when you're scrolling, you could recognize an ad and keep oh, on yeah. moving is unbelievable. Yeah. And so I think like understanding like your content can't look like an ad and your ads can't look like ads. And and most of the time in a lot of like traditional B2B, even some B2C, it's like your content, everything looks like an ad. It looks professional, it looks polished, it looks yeah. clean, it looks, you know, put together. Like, and that to me feels like a, a spot where companies are starting to move away from, but it also feels risky for companies to do that because it feels, it doesn't feel professional, quote unquote. It doesn't feel, yeah. um, oh, you know, how are we going to sell into the enterprise, <laughs> to well, an enterprise, you know, if we're, if we're doing that, yeah. you know? So before joining Metadata, I was at another company and we were working on our content. I was like, Metadata is so fun. Their content is so fun and human and they have memes. And there's like legal will not approve memes. You cannot use you cannot use someone else's like character for commercialization. Memes are not allowed to be used for, for any corporate communications. I was like, but I just want to share a meme. And they're like, no. And I look at metadata. I was like, why do they get memes? <laughs> like, why can't we be fun? Why can't we be human? Cause I, I, I feel like that helped the brand grow, right? That mm -hmm. human side of it. And the 
Benjamin Franklin <laughs> everywhere. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's uh that's a great point. Is like the bigger the org gets, the harder it is yeah. to kind of tap into that sometimes. Yeah. And that was that was their fear was that if they used if they used a meme or something from pop culture or like made a TikTok with a trending sound, <laughs> that they would get sued. And it was a lawsuit waiting to happen. It's like, well, we're just missing out on on being human. And I think especially selling to marketers. You it's know, a tough way to it's a tough way to live when you're just yeah. constantly trying to play like defense. Yeah. A hundred percent. It's exhausting. You know, get rid of legal teams. That's the takeaway <laughs> is uh, to make your content distribution better. Get rid of your legal team. Have them only do client contracts. Get what them out of wrong? marketing. <laughs> I Asterix, don't advise this. That's, Jess. <laughs> That's Jess's. That's <laughs> The, uh, the views and opinions shared on this podcast do not reflect either of our companies. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> you need a disclaimer. <laughs> oh, but I think uh, I think you know you've been in roles right where you're sold into marketers. Marketers were the ones typically producing content too. So I think we, when we see it, like we see it right away as an ad, and we see the thought process behind it, and. I've seen many TikTok videos that came out like four months after the trend was done. And you're just like, oh yeah, that's that that was a lot of meetings to get that done. And it probably took long and delayed. You know, you kind of you can think through like the back end of it. You know, I, I can't imagine if you sell into like certain demographics that are just not as as in tune to the marketing world where they could see those ads and be like, oh yeah, no, this is just normal content. Like that celebrity really uses those whitening strips. That's exactly how I'm going to get white teeth. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. It's, they, it's, uh, they fall for it. <laughs> our, our magic, our black magic we do as marketers. Have you been on threads yet? I also have not. I have an iPhone. not. Uh, I, I like can't, woke up the other day and it was just like threads or threads. Th 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 so I don't have like disclaimer i don't have social or email on my phone right now like i'm going through a uh Ooh, tell a, like, me about that life a detox uh, i did it for a vacation i said i went on vacation i said i'm just gonna delete all these so i can be like present with my family and like actually enjoy the vacation because even even if you're not running your own business it's too easy to get sucked into like yeah. well let me just check that slack let me just yeah. check that email like what like, what if something comes through and then even if it's something good like oh contracts are to be signed or uh you know uh yes this has been approved it's like now you're thinking about that and so like I, it was it was a very conscious effort for me to not do that and uh and so i just deleted them and i, I like was pretty hardcore about it and i came back from vacation and i'm like oh i don't think i'm gonna add these back on and it's been awesome. Like yeah. I, cause I would find myself, especially, especially running my own business, like checking email all the time. And again, like there was never any fires. There was, there was never anything that like, I couldn't go respond to that the next morning and like get it figured out <laughs> like never. And so it's really taken some of that off all that to say, like, no, I haven't tried threads because I'm like going through this time where I'm like, Oh, I don't really want anything on my phone and i don't want to like i don't know i'll probably get sucked into it at some point but i'm just kind of curious to see see where it goes i've been i've been paying attention to it though you, yeah. it sounds like you said you haven't been on either no i you know i built my own pc in 2017 and never looked back and never went back to iphone so i don't have i have an ipad that i use for one of our comp like for calls sometimes but um, I don't have an iPhone and it's iPhone only. And so I got you. I just don't have it. And it, does it hurt me a little bit? Yes. Am I sad? Yes. Uh, I understand why companies develop for iPhone first. It's much simpler, but it is a bit, I was like, man, I feel like I'm kind of like missing out on it. Uh, but I feel like I've been, I've been early user to so many platforms that I'm, I'm okay kind of sitting this one out. Similar to your journey, but much less severe. I removed all Slack instances off my phone except for my main work one because I found that I was sitting on there continuously checking things. And I so now I just have it on my work computer. And so when I'm not at the computer, I'm then not working. So yep. I'm trying to trying to not work outside of like a normal working schedule. And it's been really quite difficult. Um, but yeah, nothing. I've missed some 
I've joined some conversations late. And what I found is people were tagging me and asking what I thought on it. So instead of me being there right away, people were starting to like ask, you know, it felt good to be wanted. Um, but yeah, nothing, nothing catastrophic happened. What do you have on your phone? Is it just like phone text message? Yeah. I mean, I've, uh, if you open, if you open my screen, it's, it's literally, I have it set up to where it's, uh, it's nothing on there right now. And then I have oh, one shit. tiny button with stuff. So like, I, I try to like yeah. limit the temptation of like opening and now that like nothing's there, it's, it's really like, what is there to look at? I yeah. do have like, so I have like Chromecast all over my, like that's how I watch TV and stuff. So I have all like my shows and apps and stuff on there. I have YouTube. I'm like, uh, I watch a ton of YouTube videos and podcasts, Spotify, stuff like yeah. that. So I still have like content that I consume. So I'm not like perfect in that regard. Like I can still sit there and flip through like YouTube shorts. That's probably the one demise uh, to this whole, uh, this whole idea that I have in my head is um, shorts. But I think for the most part, it's, it's been really, really good to just not, I'm trying to not be on screens as much. I'm yeah. on screens all day working, talking to people, doing it. So like I'm trying to do a better job of getting off them and to not feel the constant pressure to be on all yeah. the time. And so it, it's been really good. It's so weird for me to say this because I've worked remote forever. I worked remote as an intern for a while in college and was always in a role where I was like traveling a lot. So I'd work from wherever. I got a physical office because I was having such difficulty removing myself from working in the evening. And I also like play Call of Duty. It's like my only hobby. And so if I was on calls all day, maybe at an early morning start, I would be on the computer for like mm. 12 hours. And I'm like, this is just, and I have a sit stand computer, but I'm like, this is like not okay. And I'm like, oh, I miss, you know, at least when I was in the office, I'd walk between meetings. You know, I would like get up and move around more. And so I actually got a, a physical, we're in my office. I got a physical office so that I would have to leave my house at least once a day and not just, Smart. I went like a week and a half once without leaving the house at all. And I was like, this is not good. Like, this is not, this is not a thing that a sane person does, you know, cause I Instacarted my groceries in. And so I just didn't have to leave my house. I, I went outside. I went into my backyard, There you go. <laughs> but I didn't go anywhere. And it really, I think since getting the physical office and having, and I have employees in the area and I have like friends that, that can come over and, um, you know, I kind of use it like a social environment too, but it it really helped me try and build that separation. And now, like, I prefer to come here to work most days. Oh yeah, which is yeah. I I typically will work from uh, my favorite coffee shop at least once a week, probably twice a week for long periods of time where I could just be heads down. And then yeah, same. Like I had to dead. I had to like move my entire office situation around. Like, thankfully we have a basement and stuff. Like, this, it's my whole thing is in my basement. But like, that way, like, it's literally I moved it to like the furthest like corner down here. Yeah. So like, if I'm down there, I don't have to look at my computer. I can't see it. Like, I can't even really see it if I'm hanging out. And otherwise, it's just like be upstairs. Don't don't yeah. come down. Like that's where work happens. So like, I'm trying to do um do a better job of that too. Yeah. The modern challenges, who would have thought in like the seventies, these were not, these were not challenges people had. No, totally different. Totally yeah. different. Again, like pros and cons to it all. It's just, I think trying to, for me, it's been trying to be more um, aware of the effect that something like that might have where it's like, oh, I've got to be, you know, I've got to be down here all day long. It's like, well, you don't have to, <laughs> like you could get an office space. You could go to the coffee shop. You could go for a walk. You could like, there's these things you can yeah. do to like not be chained. Well, we're, we're coming up on time. The end question for every guest, always the same. Do you have a favorite piece of your tech stack, a favorite tool or something that you like really hate? Ooh. Sometimes people go, Sometimes people go the hate route. <laughs> so throwing that out as an option. My but. my favorite, and again, this is um this is something I started using and there and there are a bunch of different tools like this, but this is something I started using when I built up the consultancy is a tool called Fathom. And I've heard it, of them. It's a essentially a call recorder. It'll hop on, but it's got some AI stuff built in. And I love it because I can record all my meetings. And then just if there are things I need to follow up in that meeting, rather than writing things down and then trying to feel like, what was that chicken scratch? I can just like review or 
you know, check on this or make a note and it'll highlight it. And I can just go back to that call after and play the highlights and say, oh yeah, that's what I need to do. That's on my checklist. Yep. Okay. I need to get them that. Yep. That's what that is. And so it's just a, a super helpful way to be able to do that um, to where I'm not having to, you know, just try, try to remember everything. I could just be present in the call. And if something's interesting, I can just click a button real quick. Yeah. I love that. Well, thank you for sharing your tool. Uh, thank you for joining us today. It was a great conversation. If anyone listening or watching wants to learn more, all of Justin's links will be in the description below. Leave a comment, of course, you know, follow on social. We're both everywhere. <laughs> Come hang out. All right. Well, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Marketers Talking Marketing. We have a ton of great content coming out to make sure you don't miss any of our future episodes. Make sure you subscribe and hit the bell notification below.